Hello. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Jack Grover. I'm the founder of Grove Bags. I'm a packaging, cultivation, and material sciences uh, nerd. Our innovations at Grove Bags have won uh, awards and been featured everywhere from High Times to uh, mainstream publications and companies such as Dow. Uh, we've packaged over 10 million pounds of flour at Grove Bags in over 50 countries. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here with you today and hopefully gain a thing or two from my discussion. So I'm going to talk about a few things today that I think are essential for anyone to know before they enter the cannabis business from a packaging decision-making standpoint. I want to cover curing and storing and how that's as, just as impactful as, uh, to the cannabis as uh, the way it's grown and how impactful it is overall to the bottom line and health of your business and brand. I want to talk about cultivation versus retail packaging. I want to talk a little bit about some of the consequences of bad packaging touch slightly on traditional packaging materials in the cannabis industry and the common pitfalls with them. I want to talk a little bit about packaging and impact on product quality throughout the life cycle of that product. And then lastly, we're going to talk about importance of branding at retail, discuss some iconic brands uh, and some leaders in the industry, and then we'll follow up with some key takeaways. So first, let's talk about cannabis packaging before commercialization. Familiar things either from movies or our personal experiences, such as standard plastic sandwich bags, prescription bottles, and mason jars. And let's go through each one and we'll talk a little bit about the pitfalls and we'll build on some of these themes and ideas throughout the presentation and throughout our, our time together today. First is the standard plastic sandwich bag. Problem with plastic sandwich bags uh, is it's a porous plastic that in addition to that, Terpenes are very abrasive, so terpenes are breaking down dam damaging bags and that notorious odor of cannabis uh, is getting through the poor oxidative barriers and poor, poor overall barrier quality of those plastic bags. So not only is it not discreet, but it's actually rapidly degrading the product from a few different angles. First is ultraviolet light, which those standard plastic sandwich bags offer no protection against. Second is oxidation. There's no, little to no oxidative barrier for those standard plastic sandwich bags. And then next, uh, other problem with those plastic sandwich bags is they carry a high static charge. And static charge is a very important thing that we visit a few times together today. And the reason for that is 90% of our terpenes in cannabis, you'll hear the word terpenes a lot, about 90% of our terpenes in cannabis are hidden and attached to the trichomes of the plant. So preserving those trichomes, those small, delicate, precious resin heads, truly the fruit of the cannabis plant, we need to have an anti-static environment because those resin heads contain, those trichomes contain 90% of the terpenes and without preserving them properly, will rapidly degrade our cannabis, uh, perhaps more damagingly so than just about any other pitfall in the storage and preservation life cycle of the plant. Uh, next, prescription bottles. Again, poor oxidative barrier, really meant for press pills and things that are with desk and packets and already good to go and have already been dehydrated to ultra low water activity levels. Water activity levels, another thing that we'll visit together a few times today. Problem with the prescription bottles is it carries a high static charge, which, as we've just discussed, damages trichomes and terpene profiles. In addition, static prescription bottles don't provide any sort of UV protection. Now, mason jars are probably the worst offender, as well as glass in general, in terms of static damage to trichomes and cannabis terpene profiles, because mason jars obviously are glass. Uh, in addition to that, while they do provide usually a very strong oxidative barrier, they usually provide no ultraviolet light protection and no protection against static charges. In addition, the commonality between all of these is that these are all static environments. They're not active and they're not reactive, which again, we'll visit in a little bit. So let's talk a little bit about improper packaging. Uh, it really has cascading effects in this industry, perhaps in a more unique and dramatic way than in any other industry. As we see there on the left, we've got a picture of uh, some trichomes, um, so anyways, what could go wrong? First off is molding. We found at Grove Bags that for every percent moisture content that you are, over 12 
percent moisture content for the cannabis plant you're going to increase your chances of molding in that bag and anaerobic bacteria outbreak by about double every point you go up so a five point increase in our uh moisture content above that threshold uh means more than a five time likelihood of us having a mold outbreak uh, product potency degradation oftentimes more than 40 percent to 50 percent of our terpenes and cannabinoids are lost over the package to consumption life cycle over that shelf life cycle that life cycle of our clients products the farmers their products leaving their businesses and going to dispensaries and arriving at consumers homes and being consumed usually losing about half the medicinal effect of that plant half the taste uh, half the benefit perhaps most dramatic and the biggest concern to a lot of our clients is weight loss weight loss in this industry equivalent to money loss and allow me to illustrate that 0.1 grams extra that you're weighing out on every eighth out of 2,000 pounds sold if 0.1 grams represents about a dollar at retail point of sale for premium flour those will add up to an extra $256,000 a year at point of sale in terms of weight, water weight loss. Now, water weight is not just water weight. It's fatty lipid weight. And that fatty lipid weight, even if we can re-add moisture content to cannabis, which we can and we'll talk about later, we can never replace the integrity of those trichomes, of those fatty lipids, of the actual plant itself. Once we've degraded it, it can't truly be restored. Talk a little bit about some of the most common packaging uh, in cannabis. Uh, nylon. Nylon's enormously popular material in the packaging of cannabis. And the reason for it is that it has a phenomenal barrier property. Very little odor escapes nylon. That's why turkey bags, oven safe bags like that, are so popular in this industry. A couple of huge problems with it, though. In addition to be a very static pro material, it's actually porous that we found. So usually with these turkey bags, we're finding that our clients, when we ask them, well, do you know how your turkey bags brown and whittle over time and turn kind of crinkly with the cannabis in there, get, get almost as if a film gets a bit stained? And they say, yes, of course, because in this line of work, turkey bags are used to be very common. They still are. Um, and we found that the nature of the nylon with the high stack charge is actually pulling these fragile trichomes off the cannabis plant and into the fabric of the bag. So while it has a high barrier property, the static damage and the lack of ultraviolet light protection is actually always a really rapidly degrading plant. And a lot of times in cannabis, when we see people uh, with these nylon turkey bags nowadays, we say, well, what else are you doing with it? Finally, the industry knowledge is starting to catch up the old way of doing things is starting to become professionalized as we're seeing that you know emergence or maturation of this industry into a mature mature agricultural industry mature cpg industry uh, certainly see a lot of ptfe products and a lot of mpet mpet or more commonly known as mylar hats off to you dupont is a very common material in the cannabis packaging space because it has great barrier properties it's very easy to print on. It gives you sharp metallic graphics. It's got some nice rigidity to it. But most importantly, it's inspired to the cannabis industry from the coffee industry for that high barrier property. Problem with it is it's got the high static charge. It doesn't do anything to account for excess moisture in the bag. There's no ability for that bag to expel excess moisture. There's no ability for that material to expel excess moisture. Find a lot of times with MPET structures that we're actually drying out the material, both nylon and MPET um, to a degree are hydroscopic, particularly nylon. So they're actually drying out the product over time. You know, every year in the cannabis industry, we're seeing literally tens of millions of dollars of weight loss uh, or more just across our own clients that we acquire uh, through our through our day to day business um, in in weight loss um forgive me what i mean by that really is that the the staggering implications to our bottom line just from improper storage of of the plant by utilizing improper materials uh can really be mind-boggling 
Another thing that I, we see very commonly is glass jars. Glass jars are considered to have a premium aesthetic. While we're starting to see that decline, at least in our personal experience over at Grove Bags, glass jars remain a very steadfast part of the market. There's a certain luxe feel and nostalgia and aesthetic to them that isn't easily replicated by any other packaging method. Something that we've seen very commonly in the industry is unlined bins. Uh, would not believe the amount of labor hours spent washing bins in the cannabis industry. And what's interesting about that as well is with tax code 280E, we'll really see in the industry, people are actually can expense uh, and have tax advantages for money spent on products and, and impasse and things like that, like liners, but not for their labor. So the, the costs of that are magnified even more. So the problem with un having your bins being online is not only uh, for clients who've seen it, it's a huge waste of time in the washing process, but it also dramatically increases the chances of microbial outbreaks, strain to strain, batch to batch, and even more acutely, huge static charges on those, those plastic bins, and, and as we'll see on the right in that photograph there. Uh, one thing that's very common in cannabis today is the method known as burping. Burping is the what is known as going to a vessel with cannabis in it that has not been properly dried, opening, agitating that vessel and opening it up to allow excess moisture vapor to, to escape the vessel. Now, that's one common problem with all the packaging methods that we've described before is that the ones with really good ox, uh, oxidative barriers, the ones with really good barrier properties, aren't doing anything to account for that, um, are actually uh, exacerbating that problem. And there's there's two sources for that, as we'll go into later. One is a lack of proper SOT, SOPs, stemming from a qualitative knowledge base and not a quantitative knowledge base, which we'll discuss more soon. But the, the other facet uh, of that is that this is all passive packaging. It's not packaging that's active and responsive to the nature of the plant as, as really 21st century packaging is for modern agricultural industries. It's packaging that's tailor engineered around the physiology of the plant to extend its shelf life, its viability, and its uh, bioavailability, shall we say. One thing I do want to stop and make a big mention of is water activity levels. Water activity as a measurement might be common knowledge in modern agricultural industries that are mature, but in cannabis it is absolutely not. For most growers the, and cultivators around the world, the most common method of measuring whether or not a cannabis plant is actually ready to go is I'll take my watch strap here, but if you can bend the stem to 90 degrees and it snaps, that means it's properly dry. That's flawed for a few reasons beyond being qualitative. Cannabis colas, or buds, uh, more commonly known as the individual nuggets of flour, vary in size. And because they vary in size, they vary in moisture content. Now, what we're trying to do in the drying process is homogenize the moisture content and the water activity level across all the cannabis to a properly dried threshold, which has often been debated uh, across cannabis uh, and the measures vary quite a bit. Our rule of thumb at Grove Bags that we push all of our customers towards no matter where they are, is that cannabis is properly dried when it is at between 10.5 to 11% moisture content or 0.5 to 0.6 water activity level roughly. Now, the best way to measure that we found is with, hop, or at least inexpensively, is with hops moisture meters because hops and cannabis are so anatomically similar and so similar in nature, in fact, that you can brew beer from cannabis, uh, that those tools actually work quite well for us. But water activity is really the quantitative measurement that we are trying to push the industry towards here at Grove Bags because it gives us a much more accurate, much more precise picture of what's going on with our plant, how the plant's actually doing, and how that plant will uh, respond to being put in a vessel. Will it need to be burped? If that water activity level is too high, there's still excess moisture in that cannabis, and that vessel will need to be burped uh, if it is not a responsive vessel because it'll have a very high chance of molding. So that leads me to our solution, which I'd like to talk a little bit about. Um, 
our solution is Terplock, which is our proprietary film that we created specifically for the unique physiology of cannabis. It works with a multi-layered approach that is trying to create a 58 to 62% anti-static, uh, 58 to 62% relative humidity and anti-static antimicrobial environment. Uh, the reason that it's an ideal solution is a modified atmospheric package tailor engineered around the physiology of the plant doesn't need any excess packaging uh, processes or materials. It doesn't need oxidative packets, humidity packets, doesn't need any sort of special flushing treatments or any sort of special sprays within the bag. Put the plant in there and it's ready to go just using the natural moisture content and water activity content of the plant to power the solution. And because it's a modified atmosphere film, we can incorporate the different elements that are key to cannabis packaging. We can create a durable package that accounts for the odor of the plant that controls oxidation with a low, about 2% oxygen gas mix within the bag. Something that is anti-static, designed to control a specific humidity range, but also, very importantly, protects from UV light. Those are the key elements of any successful cannabis package. This just so happens to be our solution. As I mentioned earlier, the six layers or six questions, six elements, six key things we need to ask ourselves when packaging our cannabis at any point in the life cycle is, what's the durability of this package? Is it going to maintain compliance? Is it going to protect the discretion? Uh, and the, the family, the, the friends, the neighbors, the, the pets of the client, is it going to be discreet in its odor control? Is it going to control for low oxygen levels? Is it going to be anti-static to preserve trichomes and terpene profiles? Is it going to be a 58 to 62 percent relative humidity range in order to create a mono layer of humidity around those trichomes, further protecting them? And then, is there anything in there to? Is there anything being done to account for UV light? It might be as simple as being an opaque package, but uh, there's oftentimes so so many more complexities than that. It might be. An opaque package, but it might be in a glass jar. Or something might be in a glass jar on a shelf near a window. You know, it certainly isn't going to be the same product that the cultivator it intended. So all, all these elements and factors are at play for our clients when making decisions about how to take their product to market. It's far more complex than standard CPG in terms of the layers of complexity, both from the compliance aspect and the unique nature of this plant. So Grovebag is one of the few companies offering modified atmospheric packaging in cannabis today. Uh, the unique thing about our packaging is with our SOPs and procedure, you actually don't need to burp in our packaging. The modified atmospheric film that we've developed for cannabis is responsive to the plant in which you bring the plant down to the proper moisture range, that proper moisture content, 10.5 to 11%, or that 0.5 to 0.6 water activity level, don't need to burp it. Uh, usually when we see uh, moisture packets in the industry or flushing or the needing to burp a lot or the needing to use containers with low oxidative barriers and overfill them, all very common practices in the industry, the usually that indicates to us poor SOPs in terms of the product life cycle from the cultivation to consumption life cycle of that product. Um, or as some say, the harvest to home life cycle. There, there's, there's something not being done quite right there. Because the plant, if it has been properly dried and if it has been properly cared for, and if it has been properly preserved, it doesn't need any anything else uh, but its own natural moisture to achieve that, which is the purest, cleanest way to preserve it as well, I might add. So I want to switch gears here and talk a little bit about what we're seeing out there in the market at Growth Bags. I want to talk about some companies that we really admire as well as some things to think about when we actually make packaging decisions in cannabis. So we're going to talk a little bit about some aesthetics of some great brands. We're going to talk about consumer preferences we're seeing emerge in the market, both through our own channels and through our, through our research and boots on the ground with our sales force. Going to talk about on pack messaging and compliance and state laws. 
So branding to the point of sale, the key thing that we try to remind our clients is that you are selling a subjective qualitative product with a subjective qualitative experience. Your packaging in an industry where advertising is so heavily restricted really is going to be the thing that communicates your brand and allows us to cement a relationship. Your customer's first interaction with that packaging will set the tone for the entire experience. As uh, Steve Jobs often said, you know, packaging can be a beautiful canvas, uh, and that's and it sets the tone for the entire consumer experience. Consumers in the dispensary, we found, usually will get their impressions and make a buying experience in the first three to four seconds that they are in that store and exposed to product in the shelf. Which brings me to another point, which is prepackaged versus deli style. Deli style certainly has a place in the cannabis industry. There's a certain qualitative charm to it. It's got a feeling you have to make small talk with the bud tender while they weigh out product for you. It's uh, uh, got a bit of charm to it. But also, the reason we recommend most of our clients away from it is it takes away from the cultivator's ability to control product quality and product integrity throughout the product lifestyle. And what we mean by that is when the cultivator has no control over what that cannabis is packaged in or how it's handled over its life cycle from harvest to home, then they really are not going to be able to deliver the medicine they intend. So they're either tarnishing their brand or yet just as bad, they have no brand connection. And what I mean by that is I think a lot of what Steve D'Angelo said, uh, but big cannabis activist, very, very important work, uh, very important means a lot of very important work. Steve D'Angelo says, you know, cannabis is with you at all these different points in time that really improve people's lives. And this is, this is a health and wellness movement at its core, right, people? So when somebody goes to the park and they have severe arthritis, but they take a, you know, a, a CBD THC edible with them and it really alleviates their pain and inflammation and they're able to have a beautiful walk in the park and they really feel that sun hit their face or whether you're going to a concert with some pre-rolls and you take that pre-roll out of that pre-roll container and you go to enjoy it and you really hear that music or you're going to a meal and you you, you take a, another product out. And each one of those intervals is an opportunity for for our clients as brands to cement a relationship with, with that patient. And that's a very important opportunity that we really urge our clients not to miss because that's how you create a brand. That's how you create a relationship between your firm and between your client. And one thing I do want to touch on is what we're seeing with consumer preference in terms of rigid versus flexible packaging. There's certainly a unique aesthetic to rigid packaging uh, that a lot of marketers do prefer and always will. But we're seeing a lot of flexible packaging in the market continue to emerge and emerge more and more at point of sale as cannabis is viewed less of a unique luxury good, but more of a consumable. And that's, that's an interesting trend that we're seeing that really reminds us of mainstream CPG here at Grove Bags is this move towards flexible packaging as these products are consumables and, and part of the, their customers' everyday lives. Deli style versus prepacked, again, just touching on it lightly, we're seeing a big move towards prepackaged, which we support because we believe it, it is in the end the best for the cultivators. But prepackaged is really how modern CPG industries do things, how um, uh, a lot of states are requiring things to get done. We'll see prepackaged become more and more the norm. And as part of that prepackage, we're seeing a lot more form fill and sealing, a lot more orders for roll stock, a lot more clients building their business around automated weighing and filling machines as they scale. As we talked about a little bit, uh, just just now, um, we're really always going to be guessing at consumer preference for flexible versus rigid packaging. Each consumer's difference. Um, but we are seeing an overall shift towards flexibles, especially as brands are less, there's more opportunity for unpacked messaging with Flex. Flex customized is cheaper. It is more unique. It is not advertising the jar company. It is advertising purely the brand. Uh, in addition, it requires less labeling. So uh, additional cost and labor savings there, especially under the reality 280. Some regulatory challenges uh, that are pretty intense for, for cannabis is firstly child resistant requirements. There's a substantial increased cost for 
rigid and flexible packaging for child resistant and child resistant resealable closures. There's increasing opacity requirements across states, which are eliminating product window. What we have seen, interestingly, as a side note, is a lot of what we call peekaboo windows, uh, or a lot of companies following on to our trend of placing, because a lot of states allow anchored windows, uh, labels on bags, so you can actually peel the label back, view the contents of the bag, release the label, and the stack charge will pull that label on the, the stack charge along that adhesive will pull that label back back onto the bag and render it opaque again. Um, interesting thing, this is a fascinatingly creative industry that, that we're talking about here. Um, we're also talking about, uh, we're also seeing visibility rules change at point of sale. A lot of product display rules are having products must be sealed and behind counters. Uh, very careful at preventing any consumer interaction with the product until they purchase the product and get home. Everything needs to be in opaque, uh, sealed containers before leaving the store. Uh, that's why we're seeing a lot of exit bags. But as exit bags became more and more required in mature markets, we're seeing things move towards each individual package being each individual product being packaged in child resistant resealable container. So a lot of common retail packaging, some of which we've talked about before, is would be your Mylar bags, your MPET bags, pop-top containers, film canisters, really enormously common in the space. Actually, Cush uh, Supply Co., formerly Cush Bottles, their logo was the film pop-top canister that was used for cannabis. It's a, it's a terribly ineffective tool for storing cannabis, but something that the industry has long used. I'm um, seeing a lot of glass and plastic hard containers out there uh, as, as well in terms of different types of retail packaging. Some some custom made and for, with custom molds to individual brands and custom molded molded labeling uh, or, or etching on there. But usually it's, it's a standard commodity uh, container with a label applied to it. Uh, and I want to end quickly. I just want to talk about some of what I consider to be the, the gold standards. Either some companies here we've had the pleasure of working with and some just happen to really admire what they do. So Jungle Boy is a very popular Los Angeles brand. Very, very well known for popularizing the window in gusset and cannabis point of sale packaging. They showcase their actual product in the dispensary with the window. Um, the display product is what they sell you. Uh, it's very interesting, very powerful brand, and they were also the first to use the very commonly the the custom pouches that had, were standing with gussets, so they could stand up on a shelf rather or in a case rather than merely laying flat. Uh, for cookies, their bag is their canvas. Exotics, you know, fancy laminates, you know, exotic prints and textures, you know, big flavors, packaging that communicates that in taste, packaging that makes you want to tear that open and see the contents of what's inside. It's, it's tough for their clients to view their packaging and have the same excitement. There wouldn't be the same excitement for uh, an apple shredder flame for in, strain, for instance, if it came in a plain white bag versus a luxe, beautifully printed custom cookies packaging. Uh, it's really a company that, uh, I admire in terms of what they've done in terms of turning cannabis into a, a standardized CPG space. Really fascinating company to learn from. Mr. Moxie's Mints is a mint guy. I'm a big fan of these. Uh, came out in 2015. They're discreet and portable. They remind us of a, of a brand that we love with the embossed tins that are both portable and discreet. Product came out at a time when there was an increased emphasis on being secretive and discretion. It's one of the early microdose products, but most importantly, it stood out. It looked legitimate. It looked like it could be on the shelves of a grocery store. Consumers trusted it. Consumers wanted to know more. Consumers were interested in it because it had legitimacy to them, and because and it had legitimacy to them because of the way it was presented. It was the perfect package for that product. And I'm saying that as a bad guy. Dog walkers. Hard to talk about the pre-roll category without talking about dog walkers. They turned an experience into a product. The packaging's clean, it's cute, it's discreet, and early consumers felt like they were in on something. That's the biggest thing brands can do for their clients is make them feel like they're in part of an exclusive club. Lowell Farms is another company whose packaging I love. The Lowell Bowl is an instantly recognizable character. It's got, reminds me of the, 
uh, Chick-fil-A cow. It's got an overly great aesthetic that invites questions from curious dispensary growers. It again exudes legitimacy, professionalism, safety, and allows their clients to be confident in the product. The box and folds to function is a rolling tray in an easy to use contained area. It's it comes with matches and a striped surface. Even the one gram pre rolls have mini envelopes with two matches and a striped surface. It's really an experiential product that's packaged beautifully. So everything you need to enjoy it is it's all right there. It's, it's brilliantly done. Uh, Ness would like to talk about Wonder Bread. They always use uh, fruit in a unique way that isn't childishly cartoony, but is their own unique touch of flavor that identifies it to the California consumers, Wonder Bread. It's definitely another brand that's an early example of using rounded corners on bags and using that bag as a canvas, co covering it with color and just making it pop in the dispensary. It's a lot to be learned from, from the leader in this industry. By no means are the are many of the brands that are major today going to necessarily be the major brand leaders 20 years from now or even five years from now in the rapidly changing global category of cannabis. But there's certainly things to be learned from these early leaders right now. Just ending again on some quick things. Your typical dram is going to lose 1% of humidity every six to eight hours. That's your typical rigid container because of the poor oxidative barrier. That 1% humidity loss every six to eight hours will represent a loss of about seven and a quarter percent of your cannabinoid content, or as we've studied, you'll lose more than a third of your terpene content. Humidity loss is also damaging to your terpenoid cannabinoid content as it is drying out your cannabis and damaging those fatty trichomes, fatty lipids. Let's end with your packaging is impacting the quality of your product. There's an increased pack emphasis on packaging aesthetic in flatter category as long as every consumable category across the cannabis industry. Regulations in this space provide challenges unseen uh, at an unheralded pace compared to the traditional CPG market. And products and brands really need to stand out and inspire curiosity at the dispensary and increasingly crowded market. Thank you very much.